giddy. I'm excited. I'm, I'm so, so excited. Yeah. I'm so happy you guys are here. I could like honestly cry. Kind of gonna.
everyone. Welcome to MRAP Grand Rounds. My name is Britt Guest. And I am not Scott Kovner. What? I happen to be <laughs> Whit Johnson, but in case you've missed him, I brought Scott Kovner with me. So like, comment, subscribe, hit the little doobly-doo down below. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Scott, we miss you. Whit, we're so glad you're here with us tonight. A um, couple of updates from the MRAP universe. Um, we always have a ton of things going on. MRAP is going to be at ASAP this year. We are super, super excited. The whole MRAP crew, we're going to be in Philly. Yes. We're going to be ready to party and educate. Philly cheesesteaks. And education. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, on October 9th, we're going to have a three-hour live event show conference for MRAP. And then the fun doesn't end there because we're going to have an MRAP booth. We're even going to have a UC Maximus booth. There's going to be tons of events and fun stuff happening at those booths. So please... Stop by, say hi. Visit us. We'd love to meet you <laughs> and hang out. Uh, so tell us about who is with us tonight, Wit. We have awesome crew here with us tonight, starting with the ultrasound guru extraordinaire, Madam Dr. Jalen Avila. Yeah. Uh, we've <laughs> also got the who's who, the ultimate know-it-all, overly board certified in everything, Dr. <laughs> Sean Nort. We have the Mel Herbert. And we also get a chance to hear great tidbits from Evie Marcolini. Amazing. So tonight's show is a little different. Um, we're actually, I know, are you ready for this? It's a little different. We are going to actually do an hour-long show running through one case. And I'm going to set that case up for you right now. You ready? Let's do it. Okay. So we're going to, I'm going to set the scene. We're in a community setting. We're not in a big tertiary trauma center with trauma surgery and every other console at our fingertips. We're at a community site like we both work at. Yes, this is, <laughs> this is the best part. This is real life. This is what most of us do. Exactly. So we're at a community site and uh, we have general surgery, but the rest of our consults, they're really not in house. So you're gonna be managing this trauma patient with your nurse staff, your techs, and you. So who's our patient coming in? All right, so you get a radio call and you have a 65-year-old male who fell off of a 12-foot ladder. That's pretty much all you can hear EMS saying. This guy is really agitated. We got no other history. So that's all we got coming through the door. Okay, and so when he arrives in your ER, what's kind of your initial assessment of this guy? Yeah, so He's I, agitated. I pretty much can skip A and B because this guy is screaming his head off. He's flailing everywhere. He's thrown two techs across the room. Um, so very <laughs> agitated, airway intact. Sounds intact to me. He's screaming. Uh, I don't have a stethoscope because I really don't ever... Hard yeah. to hear much in all of that. <laughs> I'm going to presume bilateral breast sounds. I've been able to like grab his fingers real quick because I've got some decent cap refill. Okay. The one thing that is sticking out to me, though, is okay. the bone sticking out of the thigh. There's a laceration over that right thigh. Okay. There's some bone sticking out, so I'm likely dealing with an open femur fracture. Right. No pulsatile bleeding here, but there is a slow ooze going on. Um, and he's like flailing and flinging blood everywhere, so that's all I get. Okay, and at this point, I mean, he is so agitated that your techs are doing their best to get a set of vitals, but there's just no way. So we don't have vital signs, and I mean, we can't get vital signs, we can't place an IV, EMS, your nurses, nobody's been able to get IV access on this guy. Classic. So we have what seems to be a fairly sick patient. We haven't been able to do any of our assessment, and I think first off, we've got to get some of this agitation controlled. So to talk about sedation in the agitated trauma patient, we've got Sean Nort coming up next. All right, Sean. So this is a pretty, not, this isn't an uncommon problem, right? We've got a unstable, well, we don't know how stable. That's right. We've got a agitated trauma patient. He's 65. We know nothing about his medical history. We don't know what meds he's on. We don't have a set of vitals and we have no access. So we need to do something to control this agitation. To do that, I have this table that I was hoping you would go through with me to kind of talk about our different medications, the pros and cons of those medications, to try and figure out which one we should go with. Absolutely. So this guy needs to be controlled, yes. right? We need to know what's going on with him. If it's all just pain, 
treat him with fentanyl. But he's not just pain. There's more going on, right? This is yeah. not purposeful stuff that he's going on. And if you have to proceed with intubation, well, you're going to do that. But this patient's in between, yeah. and we don't even have an I.O. Because remember, if you have an I.O., anything that's IV can be given I.O. So now we're dealing with I.M. administration right. in this patient. All right, so our first class of medications, let's talk about benzos. So when we talk about benzos, really what we're talking about is midazolam. Okay. All the other ones, in my opinion, go off the shelf when it comes to the agitated trauma patient. And that's for a couple of reasons. So we have some of the pros. If this was a drug-induced methamphetamine, he's dripping sweat, you can't get the leads on him, everybody's try, trying to just dry him off, cocaine, meth, this is very sympatholytic, mm -hmm. so it's good for that reason. It's got minimal effects on both respiration and the cardiovascular system, Love which that. is a benefit, and it works great intramuscularly. Now, it's not going to work super fast, but ideally within about five minutes and probably by 10, you're going to see something. But for this guy, it's not ideal. And what are some of the cons that we have up there? Well, he's in a lot of pain. He's yeah. got an open fracture at yeah. least. Uh, so there's no analgesia. You have all seen this. You see very variable responses. Some patients are out completely with a relatively low dose. and other ones, you're giving large doses. Right. And then you can always have that paradoxical reaction. He's a little bit older. He's not elderly. But you can see a paradoxical reaction that could complicate things. So midazolam, off the table pretty much for me. Okay. My next medication is haloperidol. Because I really don't know, like, is this primarily psych? I have no idea. So haloperidol is good because everybody's very familiar with it. Mm -hmm. It is a very safe medication, uh, but the downsides of it is that it takes a while to work. So what is good, as you said, if this is psychosis, whether it be drug-induced psychosis, true psychosis, or even alcoholic withdrawal hallucinosis, this mm -hmm. is a great drug for that. Uh, the downsides, as I mentioned, is it takes a long time. And you've probably seen this, or we've all done this, where you even redose them, right. and then it catches up, and they're out for a long time. It's not working. Give them more. More That's is it. always the right answer. A <laughs> couple of things. QTC prolongation yeah. is very rare, extremely rare. The other thing is, I argue that it really doesn't lower the seizure threshold. That's a carryover, in my opinion, from phenothiazines, which can. But even if it does, so what? They have a seizure, you deal with it. Don't let <laughs> either one of those preclude you from doing it. Right. And then if they have an extra pyramidal reaction, we'll deal with that yeah. too. But haloperidol is a good choice, but no analgesia is another downside. And I think, you know, in this particular situation, the fact that it is going to take a bit longer for this medication to work is, I don't have that time right now. I mean, he potentially has a lot of serious traumatic injuries and I need to address those as quickly as possible. So talk to me about droperidol because this is like the magic drug I hear of, but I don't have access to. So what's great about droperidol is it works really quick, even within three minutes. It's great I am, and unlike haloperidol, they will not be unconscious for hours and hours and mm. hours. All the other things we talked about, QT prolongation, maybe the seizure threshold, all apply, but this is a great drug. If you don't have it on your formulary, see if you can get it on there. Unfortunately, a lot of places just don't have it because it's not on formulary. Right. And I mean, this is a great option because you're saying like three to maybe 10 minutes max. I mean, three minutes and I have agitation controlled. I can secure an airway if I need to. I mean, I just can do the rest of my assessment. Get a set of vital signs. At minimum. At yes. minimum. All right. I can't talk about p medications for agitation without bringing up ketamine. So what are the pros and cons of ketamine here? So ketamine has a lot of pros, as we all know. It works very well intramuscularly. Mm -hmm. It's got a great safety profile. It uh, does not affect respirations much, mm -hmm. uh, if at all. Cardiovascularly, it's good. Now, it may increase the blood pressure. So there's this whole concept about pop the clot. It right. was very popular years ago. And this guy's got an open fracture. Are we going to make him bleed more? But the converse to pop the clot is drain the brain. We do <laughs> not want to cause even permissive hypotension right. in somebody who already we know has a head injury, or we don't know if this guy has a head he injury, could. right? So for this, and a lot of these people are going to be young, healthy people. They can tolerate a blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a great one. Some of the things that are 
pretty rare, but a laryngospasm. So if that happens, yeah. you do something called Larson's maneuver. It's pushed behind the ears. There's a little depressions there, and it's basically a modified jaw thrust. And then someone could always have an emergency reaction. Mm -hmm. This guy's probably ultimately heading towards intubation, maybe, right. but we don't know yet. Uh, the onset is very good, too. Yes. Three minutes, uh, and the dose, we have a range of two to six. I would go with five a milligrams higher, per kilo. Yeah. We need to put this guy down, and it's got great analgesia. And, I mean, like you said, worst case scenario, we do a higher dose, and he needs to be intubated. We have, that just was a great induction agent. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so w I know we don't have IV access, but is propofol an option here? Propofol, if you had IO, which let's say in the real world, most people would have IO access, so you can give it there. The good things about propofol is it works within about 30 seconds. Right. And if you think I'm going towards induction, it is a great induction uh, uh, agent. The downsides are, again, no analgesia, and it definitely can affect respirations if yeah. you're not ready or having any difficulty bagging a patient, but it will lower their blood pressure, yeah. usually pretty predictably, but sometimes they just bottom out. So you do need access, whether it be IO or IV, but propofol is at least a consideration. I mean, I love that it's fast on, fast off, because it's like, oh, if that didn't work, it's off right away and I'm not stuck with it for a long time. But I don't have a blood pressure to start with, and I don't know, there are not very many patients that I've given propofol that haven't become hypotensive. I mean, at least transiently, mm -hmm. they almost always do. Now, question for you about propofol. I never think about giving this IO. Is the dose different? Is the onset of action different when given IO versus IV? The dose is exactly the same and the onset is basically the same. So this is going Great. to work very fast. Remember, anything IV can be given IO. Now, one of my kind of new favorite combinations is Ketofol. Talk to me about Ketofol since my understanding is it's kind of the best of both worlds of the ketamine and propofol. So the thing that I like about Ketofol, and again, we do need access, whether it be IV or IO, but if you need to put this down, get this guy down quick to even get a set of vitals, that's where the propofol is very good, right. right? So that's gonna work really quickly. And then you can give it with the ketamine either at the same time or in subsequent dosages. Uh, one thing I did not mention earlier, but I wanna mention now is ketamine does not increase intracranial pressure. Yes. So you can give it, in fact, I feel that it is neuroprotective because it's an NMDA antagonist okay. and NMDA is glutamate mediated, which is not good for brains and definitely not good for damaged brains. Got it. So I don't have any concern about that uh, using this so that would be possible okay now the last medication I want to talk about because again like maybe this is just psych and agitation what do you think about olanzapine as a possible option here? So olanzapine would not be my first choice for this traumatic agitated patient I do like it mm -hmm. in the truly person two person with psychosis that yes. we think is psychiatric mediated mm -hmm. and I like it for that person that I kind of can talk down but then they rapidly escalate mm -hmm. uh, it can be given both IV and IM but the IV can cause respiratory depression it's yeah. not a direct respiratory depressant that doesn't slow down the respiratory rate but they become obtunded mm. so it's recommended to give it IM and it works very well I am some of the other benefits it does not affect the QT really at all so mm -hmm. that's a benefit uh, the downside is it can cause some hypotension because it's got some alpha blocking properties. Mm -hmm. But again, olanzapine for this patient I would not, not be my time. choice. So with the smartest toxicologist I have sitting next to me, if you have this 65-year-old trauma patient, agitated, obvious traumatic injuries, what are you using to sedate this person? Ketamine. There is like really Boom. no question in my <laughs> mind. This is a ketamine patient. And you're going with that five mg per kilo? I'm going for five mg per kilo with okay. this patient. All right, so wait, what happens next? Let's get this ketamine ready and administer to our patient. All right, so ketamine's given IM. We finally got that going. Patient comes down, is sedated. So now we can actually get our first set of vitals. So taking a quick look at them, there they are. Blood pressure 60 over 40, heart rate in the 30s oxygen sat in the 60s. This is all looking very craptastic, if you ask my professional medical opinion. Mm -hmm. But the, the question in my head is, is why, right? Initially, remember, we had that open femur fracture, and so my reflexive thought is hemorrhagic shock. You have to be careful, though, in just anchoring on that 
in this patient that we just got down and haven't really been able to fully um, assess, a lot of times we've kind of had this old practice of we know that big long bone fractures can bleed into the thigh, can hold a liter and a half. There was a 92 paper done by Lawrence that talked about that as far as what to think about for hemorrhagic shock. However, we do have some recent literature in 2018, Wettheimer actually came out with a paper where they assessed isolated femoral shaft fractures and the patient's need for MTP. And most of these patients didn't require resuscitation until post-op. Now, this is a retrospective study. It was done um, for a small patient population, but I think for me, the biggest take home here was in that polytrauma patient, not to fixate just on that femur fracture, start thinking about all of the causes. Is this neurogenic shock, fat embolism, ICH, tamponade? We still got a lot of differentials, a lot of things to think about, but first things first, I gotta start my resuscitation. So that's in the back of my head. I gotta address all of these nasty, wonky vitals. So we're bagging the patient, I'm calling for O blood. We've got MTP going, squeeze it if you don't have a pressure bag, whatever you need. And I'm feeling around trying to figure out if, I, if there's a pulse even with pressures like that and heart rate like that. I don't know if it's my pulse or if it's the patient's pulse. I wish there was another way that I could figure out if I only had another tool <laughs> for figuring this out. Hey, what? <laughs> I've actually been here the whole time, um, oh, and, I, and I happen to have an ultrasound transducer with me um, to assess for that specific thing. Pulse check? Pulse check time. Pocus and pulse checks. All right, so thanks, Wit, for letting me be involved with this resuscitation, because I always like I'm creeping around trying to find like where can I use my ultrasound transducer. Um, to be perfectly clear, I'm also like a regular physician who doesn't use ultrasound all the time, but most of the time I do. In any case, stoked to be here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna double check, right? So first things first, we are gonna do a just a subcostal view, just right under the xiphoid process here. I'm gonna get an overhand grip, I'm gonna place it right in the subcostal view right here, and I'm gonna push down pretty hard because I really wanna get that view to start out, and we get a view. Now, what do you all think about this view right here? It's a good view, but there's a whole lot of nothing <laughs> going on. I'm That's pretty sure so Wit was feeling her pulse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that happens, we're actually not that good. Actually, I'll say we're pretty bad at pulse checks. There's plenty of data that shows that we are neither sensitive nor specific, especially in the kind of like extremes. So I often will use the ultrasound, I just kind of double check all of uh, kind of what I think and what I feel. And I agree with you, this is definitely not a perfusing rhythm. So I am gonna go ahead and suggest that we go ahead and start compressions now and begin going down our uh, ACLS algorithm. So we're gonna do that. We have a phenomenal team that has just coalesced uh, around <laughs> you. Uh, you have somebody managing the airway, you have some people working on lines and all that stuff, you have meds drawn, you have everything ready to go, and you wanna go ahead and work on your first pulse check. Now there's a couple things that I'll do when I actually do pulse checks. Now the first one is about 30 seconds into the uh, kind of, uh, you know, the two minute that we do our chest compressions. Two things. Charge the defibrillator, number one. Number two, put a little gel on your transducer, have it ready to go in one hand, whatever hand's closest to the patient, and then have a rag on the other hand, all right? So when it is time for that pulse check, we're gonna go ahead and hands off, we're gonna go ahead and do that same thing. Now the patient's unconscious, they need to be resuscitated, right? I'm gonna just, just almost like punching them right in the solar plexus, just like boom, just like as hard as I can, elbow up, because I really wanna get that view as fast as possible. I have whoever's keeping track of time actually count down from 10 down to zero, and when we get to two seconds, so it's eight seconds total, I'm gonna remove the transducer and wipe the gel off because it's really hard to do chest compressions with lube all over the chest, and we don't wanna do that. That's not our vibe, so we're not gonna do that. So we wipe it off, that's how we do it so that we don't prolong pulse checks. Because unfortunately there is data that shows that when ultrasound is used, it does prolong pulse checks. But 
10 seconds is 10 seconds. Don't prolong it, right? Now, we're on our first pulse check then. Let's go back to it. And we're going to see this right here. Now, we looking at the monitor right now and we're seeing this kind of like wiggly line. We're not 100% sure what this is. What do y'all think? Is this like a V-fib? Is this a Sicily? What are we looking at here? It looks like V-fib, but it could easily be... A million hands uh, yeah. on the patient, yeah. Yeah, right, right. shaking yeah, no, the table, mm -hmm. text running. I mean, yeah. you have no idea. Yeah, it's not classic. Let me show you what the ultrasound shows, right? So here we have our ultrasound here. And again, we have that subxiphoid approach here, or subcostal window. And this is what we get. Now, what do you all think? PA, or are we thinking about a different arrhythmia? I mean, that looks like ventricular fibrillation. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. is fibrillating. That I buy, it's mm -hmm. not PEA. Whole I lot agree. of shaking going on. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bag of worms, baby. It's very bag of wormy. It's very fibrilly. Um, and so now we're going to go ahead and shock. We know it's VFib because we're directly visualizing that VFib. Now we're going to go ahead and go into our next round of CPR. We're doing our chest compressions. And all of a sudden, the RT, our colleagues, say, hey, something's different, it's a little harder to bag. And nothing's happened up here, the, the uh, uh, tube has not been dislodged. What you're trying to figure out is why all of a sudden are we a little bit more difficult to bag. And remember, chest compressions are actually ongoing at this time. With ultrasound, you definitely can look at H's and T's, right? And the, there's a couple of specific ones that you can do during compressions. You can actually look for internal hemorrhage in the setting of a fast examination. Um, you can actually look for DVTs in the lower extremities as well. And one thing that you can actually do during compressions is actually look for a pneumothorax, right? Because that is a reversible cause and would make sense because the patient is now harder to bag. So something has changed. So while we have chest compressions going on, I'm going to place my transducer just in the subclavicular area or the infraclavicular area. Now, notice I'm not putting the transducer straight up like this. I'm actually bringing it over this way right here because we want to make sure that our beam is perpendicular to that pleural line. So we have a little uh, turn this way and we get the following view here. Now this, remember, this is during chest compressions. What do y'all think? Pneumothorax or not? I mean, I'm seeing a lot of movement, right? But what do we do with this data? Well, there's B lines there. Okay. And that, to me, signifies that that lung is most likely up. Okay, now I'm probably gonna ask a dumb question, but I thought B lines mean edema, fluid in the lungs. How does that have anything to do with a pneumothorax? That's a really good point. I mean, normally with B-lines, that is exactly what we think about. We think about cardiogenic pulmonary edema. But you have to think about what exactly are B-lines. Now, B-lines are a vertical artifact. They start at the pleural line and they extend all the way down to the bottom of the screen, right? Now, we have two pleuras. We have a parietal pleura up here. We have a visceral pleura down here. The parietal pleura is basically the underside of the rib cage, and then the visceral pleura is like the lung itself. The B lines only come from the visceral pleura, the lung. So if you're able to see B lines, that means that the visceral pleura is actually touching the parietal pleura. Because remember, if there was even like a millimeter of air in between the parietal and the visceral pleura, you wouldn't be able to see the visceral pleura and so you wouldn't be able to see B lines, right? So even though you are not seeing great lung sliding or absence of lung sliding here, just like Sean said, the presence of B lines actually rules out a pneumothorax. And, you know, I'm all the way up, like right next to the, right underneath the clavicles, right? And, and I might miss a small pneumothorax, right? Because you gotta think about the concavity of the chest and free air is usually gonna start off a little more inferiorly, right? Um, but if the patient is harder to bag from a pneumothorax, a small little pneumothorax that you might see in just one intercostal space, is very unlikely to be causing problems with bagging or arrest in this patient. So this, with this one view, I'm comfortable with this not being a tension pneumothorax. Now what we're gonna do is we're in between, uh, where someone else is doing a pull check, you just wanna check the other lung, and we're gonna place a transducer on the other side. And um, I switched transducers, by the way. I went from a curvilinear to a linear transducer. And <laughs> I'm seeing this on the contralateral side. Now, what do y'all think about this one right here? Missing the ants, for sure. I'm used to like the marching mm -hmm. ants on a log. Yeah. I don't have this. I don't see a lot. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Now we have a, um, towards the right side of the screen, we have a rib with rib shadows. And then a little bit deeper to that on the left side, we have a plural line. And it's the same plural line, right? Because we always have air, but we are not seeing that sliding. We're not seeing the mm. ants marching on that side. And so with this, especially with the patient being a little bit more difficult to bag, I 100% would be very comfortable getting my blade. I personally um, prefer an 11 blade. Just doing a little finger throw, just a little finger throw across me, a little delicate one, sticking my <laughs> finger in there until that chest tube comes so that I can place it over my finger that I've done that finger throw across me in um, to relieve that uh, pneumothorax, maybe even tension pneumothorax that we have on that side right there. Now we are going through, we are doing another round of compressions and we're now in the pulse check. And in the next pulse check, Wit, phenomenal resuscitation leader, says, <laughs> I, she is. I've she seen old. her resuscitate. We work at the same hospital. No, like, you like are a phenomenal every, resuscitation. I like how everybody laughed at me. I'm no. 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 In support. In we all support. Know it's, true. Right, right. it's all true. Um, Running this code like a box. Yes, That's exactly. It. Like she does. Um, and what we do is she's like, hey, I'm fairly certain I feel a pulse. We have somebody else um, checking the femoral pulse, let's say, um, on the unaffected extremity. Um, and plus or minus, like maybe a pulse, maybe not a pulse. Let's go ahead and put the ultrasound on there to double check, right? So for this one, I decided that we're in between chest compressions. So I'm very happy to use a parasternal approach because it's not gonna be in the way of the chest compressors. So I'm gonna go ahead and place my transducer right here in the parasternal window, trying to get a parasternal long axis view. And this is what I get. Now, remember that other one that we had, right? We had no movement. How is this one different? I yeah. mean, this looks like enough of an EF to be a perfusing. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking we're, that we're actually feeling a pulse. This is perfusing vital organs. I feel pretty good that we have a pulse back. Yeah, I agree, right? And this is a pretty good ejection fraction. Mm -hmm. It might be like a little bit diminished, like maybe, I don't know, like a 40% ejection fraction maybe, but it's a pretty good ejection mm -hmm. fraction and very likely perfusing enough to get blood to the brain and blood to the heart, which those are the most important things. I mean, we want to perfuse everything, right? We want to get down to the toes. <laughs> um, but the most important thing are the brain and the heart, and I think this will get us there. Now, is there anything else on this echo that might, I guess, kind of trip us up or that we should comment on? Well, the right ventricle looks a little generous comparatively to the left ventricle on mm -hmm. this view. Yeah, that's a very good point. Now, we're at parational long axis view, the bottom kind of chamber that we're looking at is the left atrium. Right above that, we're seeing the aortic outflow tract. And then above that, we're seeing the right ventricle, which technically it's the RVOT or the right ventricular outflow tract, mm -hmm. but it is enlarged because it's bigger than the aorta, than the left atrium. And we looked before and we didn't have right heart enlargement before, and we do now. I would not push thrombolytics. I don't think this is a PE. So why is that? Because when I see a dilated right ventricle, especially in somebody that just coded, like, mm. do I need to, I mean, I think I need to be worried that they could have coded from a PE, which doesn't really quite fit this story, but I don't know why he fell off the ladder. So it's totally mm. possible that he threw a PE and then he fell because he syncopized. But I mean, you make the point that you didn't see RV dilation and now you do. So what do I need to be thinking about? So this is RV pooling. This is not necessarily due to a PE. Mm -hmm. Now what happens, even with the best chest compressions, you're not getting that forward flow. If you don't get that forward flow, it's going to back up into the right ventricle and create enlargement of that right ventricle. There's plenty of data to show that this is the case. I would not push thrombolytics. because I do not believe that this patient has a PE because we didn't have right heart strain before we resuscitated. After we resuscitated, we do. I love that we don't have to push thrombolytics in the person that also has the huge open femur. open femur fracture and God knows what else because mm -hmm. we haven't gotten to even get them to the scanner yet. So thank you so much for that. Let's recap a little bit. So we have a 65-year-old gentleman. Uh, we know that he fell off a ladder. He was very agitated. We got him sedated with ketamine. However, in that moment, we kind of pericode and then we finally arrest. We get with our ultrasound, some awesome views. He was in V-fib, we've got a shock. He ended up having a pneumothorax, got a chest tube. He's intubated, he's, he's at least got a pulse back, he's 
very stabilized, but we don't know really what's going on. So wait, at this point, post ROSC assessment, there's probably a million things going through your mind, but what are some big things that you're gonna do right away? Yeah, so as I'm coming around from the head of the bed, I mean, remember, like you don't have everything under the sun in most community settings. You've got you, you've mm -hmm. got your nursing team, you've got a few texts. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm like high-fiving everybody, like, Woo! we got them back. Got them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but clearly there's still a lot more to do, right? Mm -hmm. We're running the f next set of vitals, like the um, post rosc vitals for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm firing off labs, just thinking about things like getting a finger stick glucose, Definitely. A, a base deficit, lactate, some of those things for resuscitative efforts. I'm even thinking about that open fracture and now might be a good time to kind of get that thing in a little bit of traction or knee immobilizer or something, you know, quick washout, saline gauze in the, the laceration itself, get the cefazolin on board, get my first set of vitals. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is I essentially have a patient that I still need to get to the scanner. Yes. We don't know what caused the fall. We don't know what caused the arrest, anything like that. Before I put this guy in the scanner, I think I definitely would want to get an ECG. All right. So let's see what that ECG looked like. Yes. Take a look. All right. So I think up next we have Mel, who's going to try and interpret for us this very wonky, somewhat terrifying looking ECG. I always wanted to emerge out of an ECG, just like that, just walk out of an ECG. So uh, this is a really interesting case, and uh, this person is jacked, and I think it's perfectly appropriate to do an EKG at this point, because when you have any trauma patient, you should ask the question, why did this trauma occur? Was it because you did a stupid thing and now you are traumatized? Or in many cases, it could be a medical issue. So we don't know why this guy fell off the ladder. He may have just slipped, he may have had an MI, he may have had uh, a whole bunch of things, so if you get an EKG and it shows SD segment elevation, now you've got another thing to deal with. Then it becomes a question of what's going to kill you first, the game of what's going to kill you first. But here's the EKG that they got. And what is this consistent with? So just take a look at it. What's your first impression? Obviously, your first impression should be this is also jacked, just like the patient. So what I see is a diffuse a T wave inversion across the precordium out laterally, um, even inferiorly. And they're deep and they're fairly symmetric. And this is terrifying to me. We have actually a chapter in Corpendium on uh, what are the causes of T-wave inversion in the anterior leads because this comes up a lot. And I'll list them out. We said there was like Brugada, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, Wellen syndrome, uh, uh, right ventricular dysplasia, MI, myocarditis, PE. So the big ones I worry about here is that could this actually be a big PE? Could this be a huge amount of ischemia? Could this be a big bleed in the head? Big intracranial bleeding can cause this. And there is no, well, let me show you. This is an MI. Now let me show you another EKG. This is a, an EKG of somebody with a huge subarachnoid. It's the same. This is a, a PE, a massive PE in somebody that's dying. Here's their EKG. They all look the same. I actually scoured the medical literature and there is really no way on EKG to tell the difference between those entities. Because what's probably happening when you get an EKG like this is that you have a massive catechol surge. You're having a massive MI, you're having a massive PE, you're having a massive bleed in your brain, and your brain box is connected to your heart box, and you get these changes. You'll often also see not just this T-wave inversion, but QT prolongation. And here's the real bummer, right? If you have a massive bleed in your brain, you can go into V-fib like this patient did because you're bleeding in your brain. If you've got a massive PE and you have a massive catechol surge, you can also get Q2 prolongation and you can have a cardiac arrest from that and you can have it from ischemia. So this in particular doesn't tell us what's going on. I think it's important sometimes there is something on the EKG which really means as soon as I fix the bleeding world elsewhere, I might have to go fix an MI or a PE. But in this case, this is actually consistent with a number of different terrible entities, including bleeding in your brain, massive PE, um, ischemia, massive ischemia, and this could occur just post arrest as well. So this, in this junction, not very helpful. You've got some more work to do. So I throw it back to the crew. Where are you going next? So I think where we're going is the CT scanner. 
we've got this person intubated. We've got this person at least as stabilized as we possibly can, but we really need to assess for some of these traumatic injuries, right? Is there a brain bleed? Is there something going on in the thorax, the abdomen? Why did this person code in the first place? So we take the patient to the scanner and this is our CT scan. And what we see here is obviously a very large epidural bleed. Um, the vital signs that we have now that we're repeating vital signs, we have a patient who's pretty dang hypertensive. We're talking 240 over 110. Their heart rate is 110. Their respiratory rate is 16 and they're intubated on the uh, vent, satting 100%. So the big question here is, if this is our main injury, we've got to get better control of that blood pressure. And what's the best way to do that? Are we starting a nicardipine trip? Are we turning to another agent like a beta blocker? Have, we don't have this patient even really sedated at this point because they're not seemingly bucking the vent, but maybe there's a lot of pain to deal with. So we have um, Mel that ended up talking to Evie with a little bit more insight on how to best manage blood pressure in somebody with a traumatic intracranial bleed. So obviously this is a complicated, you've got this giant amount of intracranial bleeding. So I needed to talk to an expert, a content area expert. So I found Evie Michelini, who is an ER doc, also a neurocritical care intensivist. And I asked Evie two basic questions, just for, in general, overall, when we're thinking about what should the blood pressure be in a trauma patient with bleeding in their brain, about what level should we be? Because obviously a lot of these patients are a little hypotensive, some are a little hypertensive. So in sort of the general patient, what should that number be? And then I asked her specifically in somebody who's really hypertensive, what should you do? And then we talked a little bit about what to do in that patient or the, the, whether the literature from spontaneous intracranial bleeding can tell us uh, what to do with somebody with traumatic intracranial bleeding. So Evie Michelini, do your thing. This is a great question and I'm glad we're diving into it because it's so important in the emergency medicine world to address blood pressure right away because it really does affect outcome. And with traumatic brain injury, especially severe traumatic brain injury, it's really hard to study it because we can't randomize and prospectively study TBI. There have been some sentinel papers that have been published about blood pressure in TBI. The one that we think of so often is the Chesnut paper that told us don't ever let the blood pressure drop below 90 systolic. And we've gotten beyond that. There's a lot of new data coming out from Arizona with Dan Spate. He's studying a lot of blood pressure from the EMS world up into the emergency department and beyond and looking at the fine points of how high can we make it go and improving outcome. One of the studies that I really like from Dan that, that showed us that blood pressure up to 140 systolic improves outcome in patients with severe TBI. So we know that it's probably higher than we, than we have been targeting it over the past decades. But what's the current data that we really can rely on? Well, the thing we go to is the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines. The latest version of these guidelines is from 2012, and they pulled all the data they could find about this. There's, again, not so much data. And um, they gave us the numbers. So the numbers are a little bit odd, and um, I'll, I'll explain to you why. If you have somebody who is between the ages of 50 to 69, you should target blood pressure greater than 100 systolic. If they're less than 50 years old or greater than 69 years old, you can safely target greater than 110. And people ask two questions about this. Why this, this really seemingly non-physiologic uh bifurcation or you know separating these these uh these groups well here's the reason they looked to find whatever data they could to support the recommendations and the only class 2 study that they could find came from LA County where um they looked at 
um, any patients they could find with severe TBI from 1998 to 2005. And they initially separated the age groups to look and use logistic regression to find out where's the best blood pressure target. And that's what they came up with, with these goals. So that's why we have that. It doesn't necessarily mean that your, your 45-year-old has that much different physiology than the 55-year-old, but this is the data that they used, so that's why they made that. The second question that people ask often is, I guess I thought we were worried about cerebral perfusion pressure, and, and that we know that formula to be CPP is mean arterial pressure minus ICP. And that makes sense because you have your intracerebral arteries that are trying to perfuse the brain throughout this disaster of a severe TBI with all of the blood and mass effect that's trying to close down those arteries. So you want to keep that mean arterial pressure up in order to keep those arteries open and not cause secondary stroke. Well, People ask, why are we, why do we have guidelines that are based on systolic blood pressure if we really think about mean arterial pressure? That answer in, in, in Evie's version is because it's easy to get systolic blood pressure in pre-hospital and emergency medicine trials and put together the data. We don't necessarily always use mean arterial pressure. So we use the data we have. It's still the same concept. We're trying to keep blood pressure higher. And the, the, the higher blood pressure is in order to keep those intracerebral arteries open and not allow secondary stroke. So I asked Evie about whether we can take the literature for spontaneous intracranial bleeding and extrapolate it to traumatic intracranial bleeding. We went on a whole thing for too long. Let me summarize it. The answer is no. Very different physiology. So there's trials that looked at spontaneous bleeding and blood pressure control. They don't really relate to traumatic intracranial bleeding. That patient with severe TBI whose blood pressure is hanging up there above 200, and that brain is trying to tell us that it's working hard to keep those arteries open. I don't want to mess with it too much. My first go-to is fentanyl, a fentanyl infusion to take away some of the pain. And that should drop the blood pressure to a certain extent. In general, we don't have strict guidelines that are evidence-based for this, but we want to drop the blood pressure roughly no more than 25%. So an analgesic, like an infusion of fentanyl, is a really good agent for this. In general, we don't want brain injuries to have wide fluctuations or, or severe or rapid fluctuations in blood pressure because the injured brain is very sensitive to those pressures. And if we bring it down, I would say we want to target 200 if it's up in the 240 range, but think about just bringing it down by 25%. After you put an, a fentanyl infusion in place and get that going, if it's still super high, that's really telling us that the brain's working hard and they need to get somewhere quickly to get either a ventriculostomy to offload some pressure or to the OR to have a, a crany or some way of offloading pressure. In, in general, if that doesn't work, I'm very hesitant to add agents that are direct antihypertensives, such as labetalol, or even to put a nicardipine drip up, because traumatic brain injury patients, for the most part, are young, healthy people. And they are going to have a really significant catecholamine response to these, to these uh, antihypertensives. And you may end up dropping the blood pressure very quickly and very rapidly. So I'm really hesitant to do that. Um, and we know from the chestnut data, if, if you had just one blood pressure, one blood pressure less than 90 systolic, that worsens outcome by 150%. So we're really careful about not plummeting the blood pressure. I have not ever had a severe traumatic brain injury patient who hasn't responded to a fentanyl infusion with blood pressure. So Abby, we've gone through lots of numbers here. I can't remember, it's 4 a.m. Give me one blood pressure target that I'm supposed to use for patients with traumatic intracranial bleeding. One. If I had to choose one number, I would just think 
if the blood pressure is over 100 or 110, whichever number you can remember, you're going to be doing fine. So here's the summary. If you're going to remember one number, remember 100 to 110. That's the systolic blood pressure that you want. And then if they're really hypertensive, Evie talked about using fentanyl. So use your usual dose, 50 to 100 mics, say. And then a fentanyl infusion of 0.5 to 2 mics per kilo per hour. And that should uh, make them feel better and bring their pressure down if they've got a super high blood pressure. And she was really resistant to the idea of using other agents to drop that blood pressure because the last thing you want is to have a hypotensive episode. The outcomes are much worse. So think twice three times, four times, using anything more than something like fentanyl to sedate these really hypertensive patients who have a traumatic intracranial bleed. Thank you, Evie. All right, so whirlwind case, polytrauma patient that we have going on. We went through a huge amount of recess here, got this guy in and out of the scanner, fortunately, got our recs from Dr. Marcolini. Um, and so now we've got the patient, we've started them on that fentanyl drip. We've brought that blood pressure down gently. So we're saying around 200 at this point. And now I gotta get them to a higher level of care. So. I'm packing them up to send them off, transfer them to the trauma center where I've got neurosurgery team and trauma team laying in wait to, you know, help us out. So there we go with the case. They survived. <laughs> nice job, team. Okay, there was some really awesome discussion in the chat, and there are a couple questions that came up. Um, IO, IO would be a great, just like initial trauma line, right? What would be the, is there a better place for an IO? What would be our preferred site? Is there a preferred site or is it just the one you can get? <laughs> I think really it's dealer's choice almost. I mean, you don't want to go into the affected extremity clearly, right? So you could do proximal tibia, you could do distal femur, but there is an argument for maybe doing proximal humerus if you have to code them again and maybe the drugs are closer to the heart or something like that. So, but I would say whichever one you're most comfortable with to get that access and move the case along, I think yeah. I'm okay with. I'm a huge fan of the humoral IO. I just feel like it's straight to the heart. You can get a lot of like a big bolus of blood, fluid resuscitation, your meds all right there. And then we don't have to worry about like, we don't even know right now, does this guy have pelvic fracture and things that we need to worry about? And if we put IOs in the lower extremity, are we just dumping that potentially into the pelvis and it's not getting anywhere? Um, okay, so next question, Sean, I actually wanted to direct this one to you as well. There was a poll in the chat that was asking kind of what the audience would use to sedate this person. And 57% of them agreed ketamine, but there was also 28% that felt more comfortable using Haldol. Thoughts on that? So I think from a traditional standpoint, haloperidol has been used quite a bit in mm -hmm. trauma. I mean, if you were to like, I think, survey trauma surgeons, most of them would say over their career in this type of patient. But for all the reasons we discussed earlier, I think ketamine's a better choice. And the, again, just to revisit, don't worry about increased intracranial pressure. Don't worry about increased intraocular pressure. Yeah. This guy's definitely at risk for seizing. He's got his dose of uh, levetiracetam or Keppra. But remember, uh, ketamine, works well for seizures too. So for me, it's still ketamine. So hopefully we can convert a couple of the people who are watching tonight. <laughs> All right. Um, so now to turn a question to our ultrasound master, <laughs> there was a question that came up for checking pulses. Is there any difference with using ephemeral or carotid location for checking that pulse? No, that's great. Um, now we only use the cardiac right. version of like the pulse check, but there definitely is more and more data coming out that shows that you can actually look at the carotid and the femoral. Um, there was one study uh, that came out where they actually, with an ultrasound, visualized if they could compress the carotid artery. Um, that one works, they just didn't have like a gold standard. And then it makes me kind of uncomfortable like pushing into the neck, into the carotid artery like that hard. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any bad outcomes in that study. Um, that's one thing. And then there was, I'm so happy about this study. It was 2022 resuscitation, 
Cone et al. Um, it was just under 100 patients, and they did a femoral uh, Doppler, actually, like the, mm -hmm. the, the one that gives you like the sound and the big spikes. Um, and they actually correlated it with an art line, and they found that if you had a peak systolic velocity, that's the peak of that like waveform of 20 centimeters uh, per second or greater, it actually correlated to a systolic blood pressure of 60. Huh. So it actually, there is, now we're starting to get a little more data yep. that shows us that you can actually use that as an objective measure to identify what the patient's actual blood pressure is as a replacement essentially for an art line, which is actually a big deal because it's yeah. kind of hard to place art, art lines intra arrest, right? But with an Absolutely. ultrasound, it's, you just put it on the, in the groin and you get the number. I do want more data before I'm like, yeah, we should do this on everybody yeah. and this is how we should do it. Um, and I anticipate we'll get a lot more. So I, right now the data shows femoral, um, but I, have looked at both um, and they've been useful. I think my only hesitation for carotid in a traumatic kind of arrest situation mm -hmm. is that I don't know what the C spine's doing. Right. And I need to keep that C spine uh, immobilized. I need that C collar. So I'd be a little hesitant to start shoving an ultrasound probe mm -hmm. and twisting their neck, but yeah. really interesting study. Um, Wit, question that came up. What about a thoracotomy in this patient? Why did we not consider that in our resuscitation efforts? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm always all about procedures. I love them. <laughs> I'm looking for procedures at all times, but I think um, one thing that's very important to remember is resource utilization and where you are. And there's a big difference, I think, between being in an academic setting where you've got like your trauma surgery team there, OR is upstairs ready to go. Um, let's look at this case, right? We've got blunt trauma in this patient. Yeah. We had the ultrasound already that didn't show any cardiac tamponade. Mm -hmm. So when you open the chest, what is it that you're going to be expecting? What can you repair? What is it that we're looking for? And let's say, you know, maybe it was a crazy aortic injury and we cross clamp the aorta, then what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, you have to be very careful with the indications for what sounds sexy in the community setting. Mm -hmm. Just kind of taking all those things into mm -hmm. mind. I don't know, Sean, like what your thought is about it. But I know we talked about it earlier. Uh, I, I would agree with uh, everything you said. I mean, there's really no injury to the box that we can see. There's nothing penetrating there. Jalen did the ultrasound and right? They got a couple of rounds of compressions and came mm -hmm. back with the thoracostomy. So internal cardiac massage, I don't think is really a role. Intracardiac, epi all these things. So for all the reasons you, you said and more, <laughs> I don't think the thoracotomy is indicated in this patient. Totally agree. But totally definitely agree. a good thought. <laughs> totally that would be a thought. great the first thought. thing that I'm like, and oh my gosh. And this person was like, simultaneously stabbed in the chest and then <laughs> fell off the ladder and had a pericardial effusion or <laughs> even potentially a big lung laceration that we could repair. <laughs> but I think in just a pure blunt trauma, the survival rate of that is so, so low. And we're in a community setting. We don't have a surgeon right there. So right. like you said, kind of where's our end game? Mel, question for you. Yes. So you reviewed that really scary EKG. Yes. Wellens came up as a thought. Mm -hmm. Why anything lead towards or against that being Wellens? It could be Wellens, but um, if you look at that EKG, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Wellens is classically mm -hmm. sort of uh, anterior V1 through V4. Mm -hmm. So when you see it everywhere, that suggests something more catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, and it is interesting when you look at the literature here that all of these things result in, at the extreme, this huge catechol surge, which uh, some people have posited is what causes these EKG mm -hmm. changes, and all these other things that I didn't really understand, I don't think, which is these people go into V-fib. They have such a huge catechol surge, their QTs prolong, and then they arrest. And that can be from ischemia, it can be from the trauma, it can be the bleed in here, it can mm -hmm. be from the PE. So um, as we said there, it's, that alone doesn't help me. If that was in a, in a territory, an anterior territory mm -hmm. or an inferior territory, mm -hmm. then I'm thinking, okay, this, mate, this guy had an MI and he fell off and then he broke his leg and he's bleeding to his head. But when it's all over like that, it's not particularly helpful. All right. There's one other thing I kind of wanted to bring up, that blood pressure, because we go from a pulseless patient with no blood pressure, and then by the time we get them out of the scanner, their blood pressure is 240. So Mel, thoughts on that and why that could have been the case, why that blood pressure gets so high? Well, again, the way I would put it together, I think, is um, he's having this huge catechol surge, personally. His own catechols pouring out like, I'm dying, there's a big thing in here. Oh my gosh, I've got to perfume my brain, as Evie was saying. Get the blood pressure up quick, perfuse, perfuse. And uh, at the same time, uh, he's had a catech arrest because 
He has too many catacols. And you gave him some catacols. <laughs> so we pumped him full zero, of epi during that code, right? <laughs> zero to, and you'd see that more often in young people. Usually older people don't, uh, can't mount up in a response like that, but sometimes you do. So I think that's how I would put it together, yeah. is that there's a bunch of catacols, and then when you've got the heart beating, the heart's like, whoa! <laughs> and vasoconstricting everything. So yeah. that's why Evie was very uh, uh, clear about saying, you've got to be really careful, because now what you want to do is like, oh, damn, let me get the blood pressure down. Yeah. And that's when you go from 240 to 30. So sedate the patient, do all the right things, and then just take your own pulse and let's see this come down. Because if you now push them with a vasoactive agent to drop their blood pressure, they can vasodilate yeah. and dump. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, I agree. So from a sedation standpoint, I agree with the fentanyl. I'd probably add midazolam on for those sympatholytic mm -hmm. properties. It's all a little seizure protective because you don't want this person getting transported. Whitney went to all this trouble <laughs> to get them out <laughs> and now they are hypotensive en route and yeah. people might be pushing epi or doing, and the last thing you ever want to do in my opinion, is start treating a med that you gave, right? So you gave them the cardipine, now they bought them out, now you're giving them a meper, you're pushing some, uh, something else, and then now they're too high, and now you're going up on your, when you get into that cycle, that's badness. Yeah. So par just park them, get them to the place where they need to be safely, and fentanyl, midazolam, would be what I would do. I wouldn't do dexmedetomidine, and I would not do propofol for the reasons of the risk of hypotension. Evie talked about that literature, and that's the one thing that I trust out of this literature, because I don't think it's really robust, mm -hmm. but there is a really strong association between having a hypotensive episode mm -hmm. and a worse outcome. Yeah. So you really are mostly trying to stop that happening. And I think that in part of this case, you know, we intubate them during the code, we get them, you know, there's ROSC and we want to get them off to the scanner, but we didn't give them anything for sedation. Like you were saying, maybe a couple, you know, a push of vent, a push of Versed. This patient wasn't bucking the vent. This patient wasn't moving around. He wasn't agitated anymore. But we have to remember, we just shoved plastic down this guy's throat and that's very painful and very mm -hmm. irritating. So even if the patient isn't moving and agitated, you mm -hmm. still need to remember to get some good sedation and pain control on board, which I think in part is after all that epi, now plastic down their throat. We really need to do a better job of controlling the pain, sedating the patient, controlling that blood pressure. All right, that is a wrap. That is our case. Thank you so much for playing along and going through a whole complicated trauma case with us. A um, Couple updates, our next show next month, August 2nd, we're gonna be doing urgent care grand rounds. Uh, we've got new interns starting, so don't forget there's some amazing study guides that WIT has personally made. Woo! Um, on Corpendium, super helpful, check those out. Um, and then as well, there's a lot of new interns starting, so there on YouTube, we have a resident jump start. Um, and for our new attendings, there is also a new attending launch pad. You can check that all out on YouTube. So again, thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the show. <laughs>